One of the most difficult things for people to understand is how it could be that a nation that saw itself as breaking away from tyranny and oppression could oppress other people, could in fact hold many, many people in bondage. How do you reconcile those two things? We think of Thomas Jefferson as the author of the American Creed, the Declaration of Independence, talking about the equality of all mankind and the right to pursue happiness. But even he was conservative on the point of actually effectuating a change in slavery. So Jefferson's understanding about the Declaration, the universal principles, was something he thought would come later on in the American experiment rather than something that would be immediate. And that's something that's very difficult for us to understand because we made the choice and we understand that slavery was an evil and it's an evil that should have been eradicated as quickly as possible, but that was not the perspective at the time and that was not Jefferson's perspective at the time. When the framers were coming together, arguing about how to create the United States of America, the Southerners were not gonna come into the Union unless they had an assurance that their interest in human property would be protected. So the Constitution of the United States, and some people would say in contravention of the ideas of the Declaration of Independence, protected slavery. Many of the American revolutionaries thought that slavery was a dying institution. The compromise was to have it where it existed and that eventually, at some point, slavery would die out. Now, people's understanding about dying out <laughs> could extend over decades or centuries. But the idea was that eventually things would change. As it becomes clear that slavery is not dying, that in fact the institution is becoming more and more prosperous, slave prices are going up, and the revolutionary generation, many people in the Deep South, South Carolina in particular, had already come to the notion that Slavery was integral to their lives, not just because of the economic factors, but because slavery was a system of control. There were many more blacks in South Carolina than whites. So they're thinking about economics, but they're also thinking about their own protection. As slave prices began to grow, as the country begins to move west, they become much more wedded to the idea of slavery. Slavery becomes expansionist, and the Northerners who had agreed to come into the Union thinking that it was going to be in this one place and that it would eventually die, become alarmed. As they began to make noises about their dissatisfaction with this, the Southerners point to the Constitution and say, this is the deal we made. We came in with the understanding that we'd be able to keep our slaves. And the North says, no, we thought you would keep your slaves, but in the places where it was. This expansionist notion changes the entire nature of the country, what they would call the slave power, that America would not be a free nation, it would be a nation that was supported and lived on slavery. Northerners who had made a choice against that with their gradual emancipation statutes in the immediate aftermath of the revolution would be pulled along with all of this. So the South becomes much more aggressive as the revolutionary generation gives way to the generation that sees slavery not as a necessary evil, but as a positive good. And that's a big switch to go from saying, all right, this is something that we have, it's evil, and eventually go away, to people saying, no, the natural state of African people in particular is to be enslaved, and it is God's choice for us to do so and to become aggressive about it. So the South begins to look at the Constitution and make the, this a matter of a constitutional argument that you agreed to let us do this and you cannot change the deal that we made. 